So, what does this portion of Scripture mean? In Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. Is the writer Paul saying, hey, we are all the same? Is this maybe a call for all lives matter? Let me quickly say no and no. You see, the Galatian church, like many newly formed churches, desired to follow Jesus. They really did want to follow Jesus, and yet they were held captive by the law. And as their spiritual overseer, Paul, is helping them move from living life on the foundation of the law to living in Christ with love as their foundation. This is a radical message coming from Paul because before his dynamic uh, decision to follow Jesus, he was a religious leader, a Pharisee. The law was Paul's foundation for life. And in fact, it was the law that drove Paul to lead campaigns against Jesus' gospel. It was the law that influenced Paul to have his followers kill uh, followers of Jesus. Before his conversion, the law was a kind of salvation for Paul and his colleagues. The law was one's ticket to heaven, and if you carefully followed the law, point by point, you were seen worthy in God's eyes. So they thought. I also want to point out that in its time, the law was a safety guide for the people, a bit like the do's and don'ts we have for our young children. The law helped the people of Israel to be safe. But the law had its problems. Jesus noted these problems and was often chastised by the religious leaders for breaking the law. One law in particular that I am familiar with maybe the most was the table law. Jesus opened the table for all to dine with him, whereas the law said that a godly person was only to eat with certain types of people, people who were deemed clean, people who were seen to be holy. Over and over throughout his life, while Jesus was on earth, Jesus said, hey, in so many words, hey, love is God's foundation for living. This Levitical law had other problems. The law gave men greater privileges over women. It was the men who were given the sign of the covenant, whereas in Christ, baptism is applied to all, male and female. The law said that only men were capable of being kings and priests. But Jesus, standing on the foundation of love, included women to preach the good news. Under the law, there was a power differential. In Christ, however, we are all one with one another and one with God, the source of all being. Under the law, a person went through a priest, a male priest, to bring their cares and needs to God. In Christ, each of us, no matter who we are, is free to be in direct relationship with God. In Christ, well, in one of the problems with seeing the law as the foundation for life is that we then, as we focus on the law, as we become focused on the law, we then begin to completely misunderstand God. We then begin to see conforming to the law 
as the thing that matters most to God. And we begin to imagine God disapprovingly watching us, counting our mistakes and holding them against us. That's the type of religious atmosphere Jesus stepped into when he came to earth. A religion based on the law and religious leaders watching the Hebrew people disapprovingly, making sure everyone was very carefully following every point of the law. And with all this attention to the fine points of the law, love, Love was overlooked. God's grace was not received, and God was misunderstood. Not only did Jesus often break the religious law, but, he, but we can read in the stories of both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament where grace and love resist the law. People who were embodied with grace resisted the law, such as the law says, said that the Moabites were not to dwell among God's people. And then we see Ruth, who bring, and then we see Naomi, who brings Ruth, a Moabite, back with her to Bethlehem. And as we know, Ruth is a direct ancestor of Jesus. The law said no foreigners or eunuchs were allowed in the synagogue or be a member of the assembly. But in Acts 3, we read in a a beautiful story of grace, an African eunuch baptized by one of Jesus' followers and thus welcomed into the church. And if you pause to think about it, there is so much more. There's Deborah the judge and Holga the prophet. There are young ones leading the elderly and, and those who are out of shelter, who, with, who are without shelter or food, are being recognized over the wealthy. Throughout our scriptures, God's Spirit moves people toward acts of love and grace in spite of the law. <clears throat> and so in this reading to the Galatians, Paul is saying, get your nose out of the law book and open up your hearts. See every creature on this earth as God's own beloved. Allow love to be your guide. Last year, our conference, the Desert Southwest, that our church is a part of, began to be serious about anti-racism. Now, just saying that term could cause some of you to squirm. It seems to make us squirm a bit. Some of us squirm because we don't believe there is racism. Some of us squirm, squirm because it's just plain down uncomfortable. You know, the churches that I pastored in Pennsylvania were very squeamish about the idea of discussing anti-racism. They would tell me, everyone here is white, so why bring up the subject? And so I led a study on the book, on the book The Help. On the first night of this study, as I was walking from the parking lot to the classroom, Alan, a very tall, large, teddy bear kind of white guy, caught up with me. We did some small talk, and then he said, you know, Pastor Mary, I'm about halfway through this book, and I am realizing, and you'll see in class when I talk, that I am a racist. His his openness and honesty caught me. And tears came to my eyes. And Alan couldn't see me because uh, he was way down up there and I was about at his waist. But I, my tears were flowing as I thought this man who I did not think would even come to this class was opening up, being honest. He told me, that he realized now that white folk have had more power 
over black folks. And that, my friends, is where Paul is going with these phrases. In Christ, no one can claim power over someone else just because of their race. In Paul's time, Jews over Greeks, today whites over blacks, or whites over Asians or Latinx, or whites over Pan-Asians and Hispanics or indigenous Americans. Paul is saying, hey, Galatian church, when you set up your service teams, the Jewish guy doesn't automatically become the leader. Don't decide who deserves more or less control or power based on their color of their skin, the size of their bank account, their gender, their sexual orientation, their age. Maybe we would even add to Paul's list, in Christ there is no boomer or millennial. What do you think? Those of us who are boomers and hear it all the time, oh, you boomer, can sometimes go, oh, yeah, let's, let's put that back in there. But it's hard to transition, isn't it, from the old ways of thinking to new ways of thinking. It was hard for those young Christians back then, and it is still hard for us today. And so Paul reminds us, that when you were baptized into Christ, you received new clothes. You became a new person. You have the wherewithal to love like Jesus. Like I said, today is Juneteenth. A day we recognize and remember the enslaved folks who learned of their freedom two and a half years after President Abraham Lincoln declared emancipation of enslaved folks. And yes, we will celebrate <clears throat> that all enslaved folks were free, but think about that. Two and a half years after President Lincoln said that they were free, did these folks in Texas learn this story? It's a troubling example of how corrupt power works to thwart love. An example of how corrupt power works to thwart love. But how do we not fall into similar patterns of living or being? How do we remember to daily value each other even though we are different from one another? How can we be in unity and yet value our differences? The psalm this morning, Psalm 42, gives us some help. It tells of one who is yearning after God. And so, my friends, as we open our hearts to God, as we yearn after God, as we sit in God's presence, in silence, opening to the Spirit's presence, placing our hope, intentionally placing your hope in God, then this wholeness that we seek will work to change our hearts and our minds. I truly believe, deep in my heart, that as we intentionally receive the love of Christ, as we mindfully become aware that we are beloved, then we can see one another as Christ sees the other, as Christ sees each of us children of God, beloved by our Creator. As we ourselves receive that we are loved, then we will be free. Free, as our baptismal vows state, free to see the evil, free to resist the evil, and resist the forces that attempt to pit us against each other because 
of our race, our gender, our age, our sexual orientation, our socioeconomic status. And then we too can say, in Christ, there is no Jew, no, nor Greek, no male, nor female, nor slave, nor free. We are all one in Christ. God desires for each of us to flourish in this life. Each of us. Each of us in this room. Each of us who are, who are worshiping online. Your neighbor next door across the street in the next neighborhood. The person that you see at Friends in the Desert. Each of us. Is, is God desires for each of us to flourish. And so may, it, may we make it so. May we make it so that our neighbors near and far experience God's love. Amen.